Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Understanding Progression, How to Identify and Treat ESR1 Mutations in Hormone Receptor Positive Metastatic Breast Cancer. I'm Kate Vieira-Fitza, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE and Senior Producer of our NBC Life podcast. And I'm Victoria Goldberg. I'm one of the producers of the Our NBC Life podcast, as probably a lot of you know. And I'm also a longtime volunteer to chair. And um, Kate and I run two, two actually support group for metastatic breast cancer patients. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We're a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with breast or gynecological cancers. We provide outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. Now it's up to me to give you a few housekeeping remarks. All participants will be muted during the presentation. Once the speaker finishes presenting, we'll begin the Q&A discussion. Please submit your questions through Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Remember that the speaker is unable to give specific medical advice. So please, please keep your questions general in nature. We'd like to also let you know that we have closed captioning available. You can enable this feature by clipping, clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and selecting the subtitle option. The webinar is pretty heavy in science, but hang in there. We'll turn it into a podcast and break down the difficult parts for better understanding. This webinar is also being recorded. We'll share the recording in a few weeks with all registrants, and it will also be added to our website. Now, I'd like it, like to hand it over to Dr. Kakliamani to introduce herself. Well, Kate and Victoria, thank you so much for this uh, honor of uh, inviting me here today. So I'm Virginia Kaklamani. I'm professor of medicine at the Division of Hematology Oncology at UT Health in San Antonio, and I am the leader of the breast cancer program there. Um, I uh, did uh, some of my training in, uh, in Boston, uh, then uh, my fellowship in uh, Chicago at Northwestern and stayed on there for quite some time before I, I moved to warmer climates in, uh, in San Antonio. And I also am one of the co-directors of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. So I hope to see many of you in uh, December. We have a full agenda of uh, just uh, amazing science and, and really good uh, uh, programs that uh, hopefully will help us cure this disease. So today I'm tasked with talking about ESR1 mutations and uh, estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, and I'm very uh, much looking forward to the Q&A at the end of the program. So Let's talk a little bit about breast cancer and then metastatic breast cancer, ear positive breast cancer, and so forth. So when we when we think of breast cancer, we divide it into different types. The, the first type is the, and the most common one is the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Uh, second type is what we call triple negative, when it doesn't really express any markers. And then the, the third type is the, the HER2 positive breast cancer. And the reason that these are important is they, they obviously have implications to how we treat our patients. And they also have implications as to, as to how aggressive these cancers are. So we're gonna focus on the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And this is the type of breast cancer that feeds off of our, our body's estrogen. It has uh, proteins on the surface of the cancer cells called the estrogen receptor. And, and those proteins um, take estrogen and they get activated. And then they tell the cell that they need to make the cell grow, duplicate, metastasize, and all of that bad stuff that happens with cancers. So this estrogen receptor is extremely important because for the longest time we have been using anti-estrogens to treat this breast cancer. The most, uh, the oldest drug that we have called tamoxifen is a, is a drug that binds the estrogen receptor and it uh, prevents it from doing all of the bad stuff that we just talked about. Um, now we also have other drugs. We have drugs called aromatase inhibitors. Those drugs tend to 
prevent the estrogen from being produced in our body. And so if there is no estrogen, then the estrogen can't bind the estrogen receptor, and then the estrogen receptor doesn't get activated. And then we have another drug called fulvestrant, which basically destroys the estrogen receptor. It's called an estrogen, a selective estrogen receptor degrader or down regulator, depending on, on who you talk to. So if you, if you look at a picture of a cancer cell or, or a bunch of cancer cells before we've given fulvestrin, you see a lot of estrogen receptors. If you give, if you take the same picture after we've given fulvestrin, those estrogen receptors have gone away and they've gone away because they've been destroyed by this drug. So each one of these drugs is, is being used for us to treat patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And fulvestrin is the one that's, all, that's only approved for, for treatment in women that have metastatic estrogen uh, receptor positive breast cancer. So breast cancer that has spread to other parts of the body, such as the, the lungs, the liver, the bones, and so forth. Now, the reason we can't cure many of these cancers is because the, they evolve. They're really smart. So they figure out what treatment we're giving and they find ways to bypass this treatment. So the way they do this is they, they accumulate changes, which we call mutations. So the, those cancer cells adapt to our treatments and then they're able to bypass them. And, and we've actually proven, at least with tamoxifen, that they're so smart, they can actually use tamoxifen eventually to, to grow. So not only is tamoxifen not killing them, but it's also becoming food for them. And, and so we, we always have to find new drugs to be able to, 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 to stay a step ahead of, 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 of the cancer cells. And sometimes we're were successful in doing that, and sometimes we're not. So as these estrogen receptor positive breast cancers adapt and they grow, especially when we, 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 give the, we treat them with drugs like tamoxifen and like aromatase inhibitors, they accumulate these mutations. And one of the mutations that they accumulate is mutations in the estrogen receptor. And so these mutations, which we call ESR1 mutations, make this receptor active all the time. And so the receptor doesn't need estrogen anymore. Even if it doesn't have estrogen, it's still active. And, and that's how it bypasses the fact that we take away the estrogen with the aromatase inhibitors, or we give a drug like tamoxifen that tries to bind the estrogen receptor because the, the receptor has changed enough that tamoxifen doesn't bind it anymore. And so we found that in, in tumors that have these ESR1 mutations, aromatase inhibitors does, don't really work that well. Uh, tamoxifen doesn't really work that well. And these cancers become more aggressive. And so they tend to grow faster. They tend to be resistant to many of our treatments. And it seemed that fulvestrant was at least partially active in this sort of breast cancer. And, and the reason is Fulvestrin attacks the estrogen receptor in a different way because, as I mentioned before, it, it destroys it. And so it's still able to work, but it doesn't work great. It just works a little bit better than aromatase inhibitors do. Um, so, so that's why these drug companies try to develop drugs similar to fulvestrin, but, but a little bit better to try to bypass what these ESR1 mutations do to the cancer. Now, I mentioned that fulvestrant works, uh, but fulvestrant, for anybody that, that has received it, it's an intramuscular injection. So that means that we don't give it as an IV shot, it's not a pill, but a woman has to receive the shot in her buttock. And we learned a long time ago that for, for, the, for, for fulvestrant to be active, we actually have to inject both buttocks with quite a bit of, 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 of drug. And obviously, because this is an intramuscular injection, we can't give a lot of the drug. We have a limitation as to how much we can give. So we found out that if we increase the dose, then the fulvestrin works better. But we got to the point where we just couldn't increase the dose anymore. And we knew that if we could, then that drug would be even more active. 
So that's why the, the, a lot of the drug companies said, well, instead of having an intramuscular drug, why don't we have an oral drug? And then we can increase the dose as much as we want to. So that's why they developed these oral medications that are similar to fulvestrin, but now we can give them at higher doses. And the thought was that, that these drugs should be active because, or more active than fulvestrin because we can give them at a higher dose. So let me give you a little bit of an example of this really cool clinical trial that was done looking at these ESR1 mutations just to, to, to help explain how they work, but also how we can bypass them with our treatments. So this was a trial that was done in France. Uh, it's called the PADA-1 trial. And, and this was a trial in women that had metastatic breast cancer, and they were put on treatment in the beginning of their, uh, their disease course. And the treatment was an aromatase inhibitor, as well as a CDK4-6 inhibitor. CDK4-6 inhibitors are drugs that we've been using since 2015 or so. They really have changed quite a bit how we treat breast cancer. They're really good drugs. They have shown to improve overall survival. Uh, so really good outcomes with these drugs. But obviously, as with many of these drugs, at some point, the cancer learns to, to bypass them. So women were taking uh, the aromatase inhibitor and the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then the investigators were drawing blood for these women and looking for these ESR1 mutations. And at the same time, they were also doing scans to see whether what was happening with the cancer. So assuming the woman had scans every three months and it looked like her disease was either better or stable, she was continuing on treatment. But then the investigators were looking at the development of these ESR1 mutations. And what they found was that these mutations in many of these women were increasing in number. And so even though the cancer was stable, at least in the scans, they could figure out that the cancer was kind of getting ready to, to grow. It was learning how to bypass the treatment with the aromatase inhibitor and the CDK4-6 inhibitor. So then they said, well, we're going to take these women that have stable disease, but where we're finding out that the ESR1 mutations are increasing, and we're going to randomize them, meaning we're going to assign them blindly to one of two groups. The one group is going to continue the same treatment until the cancer grows, which was the standard of care way to do things. And the second group would switch from the aromatase inhibitor to fulvestrant. And the reason was, again, that we had data that fulvestrant works better in tumors that have these ESR1 mutations compared to the aromatase inhibitors. So what they found was that the patients that were switched to fulvestrant actually had um, responses. They had a delay in disease progression. And then when at some point the women on the aromatase inhibitor arm were, you know, were found on the scans to have progression of disease, and then they were switched to fulvestrant, it still wasn't as good as those women that were switched early enough when we were seeing that these ESR1 mutations were developing over time. So this really was kind of a proof that we, we know that these mutations happen and they happen the longer we put women on therapy. And if we're able to identify these mutations early on, then we can make changes to the treatment that might help those women have um, more control of their disease. So that was kind of the first step in, in understanding how to, how to, how to, how to treat women with, with estrogen positive breast cancers that were, their cancers were developing these ESR1 mutations. Now, a step further was looking at those oral medications that are similar to fulvestrant, and they're called oral SIRDs, and SIRD st stands for uh, Selective Estrogen Receptor Degrader. And um, one of those oral SIRDs is called elicestrant. Now, this is one of many, and several trials were done with some of them, but this was the first drug that was kind of the furthest along, and so the large trial that the FDA wanted the company to run called the Emerald trial is the one that we have results from. So this was a trial where we tried to, we tried to look at whether Elicestrant was a better endocrine therapy compared to either fulvestrant 
or an aromatase inhibitor. And what we found in the Emerald trial was that in women who had cancers with these ESR1 mutations, elocestrin was better. It was a better endocrine therapy and it improved outcomes compared to either aromatase inhibitors or fulvestrin. And that's why the FDA in, uh, in January of, uh, of this year approved elocestrin in the treatment of cancers that have these ESR1 mutations. Now, as I mentioned, this is not the only drug that we have for, um, for, uh, as an oral CERD. There's many other drugs that uh, drug companies have looked at. Um, one called camizestrant, which is now being looked at again in uh, larger trials to see how active it is. And again, the, the thought is that it'll be active in cancers that have these ESR1 mutations. And then there's another drug called imlunestrant, which is again, similar in, in, in the sense of having a, a similar mechanism of action. But uh, this drug uh, is now being looked at in combination with other medications, with other uh, anti-estrogen therapies, as well as by itself to see whether it'll, it'll prove to be as effective as elicestrant was proved to, proven to be. Now, some results from a conference that I attended uh, last week showed that imlunestrant when you combine it with other uh, anti-hormone therapies, such as everolimus or such as alpelicib, has actually really good outcomes. Now, these were smaller trials. It, 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 it didn't have a, they didn't have a large number of patients, but the results were very impressive. And so we're going to be waiting for, for, for the larger trials with this drug, hopefully to be presented sometime next year to show whether it's effective. And if it is, the FDA is likely going to approve this medication as well for, for women with tumors that have these ESR1 mutations. Now, what are the next steps? The next steps is to look obviously at other combinations, but also to look at these drugs in the early stage setting in women that don't have metastatic breast cancer, because our, our point is to try to cure every single woman we can. So if we can use these drugs uh, in the early stage setting, then we can hopefully prevent metastatic disease. Now, one of the concerns in that, uh, in that case is that typically we don't see a lot of ESR1 mutations in the early stage breast cancer. So how effective these drugs are going to be in that setting is kind of unclear, but uh, we definitely need to, to do the studies to, to, to find that out. So these are studies that are ongoing. It'll take a few years for us to, to accrue all the patients and to wait for results. But, um, but, but this is the this is an exciting time. This is the first alcestrant, the first endocrine therapy approved for breast cancer in 20 years. So you can imagine how excited we all were to have a new drug that we can use for our patients and obviously excited that this drug worked to help prevent um, uh, progression of disease. So this is, uh, this is kind of um, the bottom line for these ESR1 mutations. Now, now how do we, how do we, find them. Um, I mentioned a little bit that uh, the, the researchers in that PADA1 trial did uh, um, blood testing. And so these mutations we can find on blood tests. It's called the liquid biopsy. And uh, so we don't have to do an actual biopsy. We don't have to biopsy the lung or the bone or the liver, uh, but we can do a, a biopsy of the, we can do a, a blood test. And in that blood test, we can find DNA that is uh, tumor specific. And these companies are able to look at that tumor-specific DNA and see if that DNA has mutations in that ESR1 gene. So this is how we do it. And we can do this test uh, more than once, and we should be doing it more than once because these mutations develop over time. So when we, when we, um, when we, when we, if we do a liquid biopsy, at the first time a woman is found to have metastatic breast cancer, she's likely not going to have an ESR1 mutation. But if we do it after her cancer progresses on one therapy, then she is more likely to have the, these mutations. If we do it after her cancer progresses after two hormone therapies, she's even more likely to have these mutations. So um, that's something that we, we all need to be aware of, that we should be looking for these mutations more than just once because they develop over time. Um, now, one of the things that also arises is, you know, we, we're, we're giving these drugs, but what is the, what is the downside? We, we've talked about the upside, but what is the downs, down, downside as far as toxicity? 
Now, this is an oral medication, and it's actually pretty well tolerated. Now, that doesn't mean that every single patient that got the drug was feeling great, but the majority of patients were. The, the, most of the side effects that, that were recorded were low-grade side effects. Most of them had to do with a little bit of nausea. Uh, obviously, this is a pill. So around 8% of the patients that were on the Emerald trial had to be on an anti-emetic. Uh, but some of them had been on an anti-emetic before they started the trial. So it's not a, a new use of anti-emetics, but, uh, but this, this drug can have a little bit of nausea. Um, other than that, it's actually pretty well tolerated. There might be some, a little bit of bloatiness, but, but most people have done pretty well with it, which is good. Uh, Fulvestrant also is typically a well-tolerated medication, except for the fact that it might cause some pain where we're injecting it in the buttock. So um, that's, that's a something to, to, to keep in mind because obviously when we're trying to make treatment decisions, uh, we have two goals in metastatic breast cancer, help women live longer and help women live better. And if we're not helping them live better because we're giving them a lot of side effects from the medications that we're prescribing, then we're really not, not, not achieving our goal. So that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, but overall in the trial, this was a pretty well-tolerated medication. Some of the other medications in the same class have been shown to have some uh, heart issues. Um, they increase, uh, they, they make, they cause changes in the EKG and that might eventually cause some arrhythmias even though that hasn't really been recorded. And, uh, and a couple of them have shown to have some ocular toxicity, so some eye issues. Um, but that's again, uh, we'll see what happens when more patients are treated with these drugs on the larger trials, because so far what we have with those are smaller trials. So um, I'll finish with that. I'm happy to, to, to take uh, questions and, and comments. But again, I, I truly appreciate you all listening in today. So we're going to start the Q&A. You can sub submit all the questions that you have in the Q&A section at the bottom. We'll try to get through all of them, but we may not have time due to time constraints. I also want to just remind everyone that try to keep your questions in general in nature. She cannot um, be specific to you. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're adding your questions. Victoria? Yes. Thank you, Dr. K Dr. Kakumani. It was such a wonderful presentation. And uh, I've actually written some notes, which is quite unusual for me. I wanted to ask you a question about uh, CERD. So Alicestrin was the first CERD approved, uh, oral CERD approved for ESR1 mutation as a monotherapy. Uh, are there ongoing trials that are testing alicestrin with other agents similar to what the, um, the uh, Ember trial is doing with the imlunacest? I, I can't even pronounce Imlunestrin, it. yes. <laughs> um, there are. So we have a trial called the Elevate trial. And this is a trial that's looking at alicestrin with all the other combinations that you can imagine. So combining it with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, combining it with alpelisib, combining it with an mTOR inhibitor called everolimus. So all of, all of these, uh, these are the, the, the next steps, right? We're giving a lot of um, combination therapy in, in, in metastatic estrogen positive breast cancer, but always keep in mind, the more drugs we give, the more toxicity we're going to cause. So we as physicians and you all as patients, need to, to have a, a happy medium where we're treating the cancer successfully, but we're also not causing a lot of side effects. So it'll be important to, to look at the results of these trials. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it, it's the, the next progression, but we, we should not forget that many of these drugs are used effectively as monotherapy as well. Thank you. So you so, talked about, um, you know, Fulvestrin and many of us are on that and it's, you know, it is, it's very painful. And if we're on it for a long period of time, 
you know, I know a lot of us in the support group, um, we were kind of looking forward to this data and saying, hey, you know what, I would much rather take a pill than, than the full vestrin shot. Um, do we see that ever sort of replacing that in the future? What can we look forward to? Yeah, so it's when 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 the so when when the Emerald trial was done, it looked at patients regardless of an ESR1 mutation because we didn't know whether elicestrin will be active in just patients with ESR1 mutations or not, because our initial data suggested it's active everywhere. And it is active everywhere, but it is more active than the drugs we have available in the patients that have tumors with ESR1 mutations. So fulvestrin, the way it was approved, because it was approved back in the 2000s, was approved for all patients, regardless of ESR1 mutations. Now, when, when the discussions with the FDA were going on, we said to them, well, please approve this drug because it's an oral drug, and it's easier to take an oral drug than to take an intramuscular drug. And they said, well, but elicestrin is as good as fulvestrin in tumors that don't have that ESR1 mutation, so we don't want to approve it. And we said, well, that's okay. Yes, it is as good, but one is a pill and one is a shot. So why don't you let clinicians and patients make that decision? And the FDA didn't agree with us. And so the approval was only in patients with ESR1 mutated tumors. Now, this may change in the future. We're waiting for overall survival from, from that trial. We're also waiting for the other trials. And if the other trials show some more efficacy or if the FDA changes their mind, they might approve the drug in all patients. And if they did, then it really would replace fulvestrin. But since right now it's only approved in ESR1 mutated tumors, it's replacing everything really in ESR1 mutated tumors. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question that was submitted, but I'll make it a little more general. So um, as you mentioned, so there are all sorts of trials going on with combinations and I'm gonna I'm gonna get it right. Imlunestrin. Imlunestrin. That's it. I got it. Imlunestrin is being tested with Everolimus in, in one arm, and with uh, um, Oxib on an as another arm. So right now this has not been approved, and we don't know if they it's gonna work as a combination. It sounds like they will work with, in combination, but the question for now. What is the sequencing for those who actually have those mutations, right? Who do have big 3 ca mutation and who do have, um, uh, well, I guess Everolimus doesn't require mutation. So what would be a, um, what would be a se sequencing right now, including uh, uh, LSSTRIN as part yeah. of sequencing? So, so that's a great question and we, we struggle a little bit. So I'll give you maybe a couple of different scenarios. So we have a patient who uh, unfortunately develops metastatic breast cancer and it's estrogen positive and HER2 negative. Our first line therapy is going to include a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy. Now the endocrine therapy depends on whether she had previously received endocrine therapy or not, but let's say she had not received endocrine therapy before. So we're gonna give an aromatase inhibitor and a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then we're gonna treat this patient for as long as this treatment works. Typically on those clinical trials, this treatment works for a couple of years. So we know that if this treatment doesn't work for more than 12 months, this is a cancer that is not really responsive to endocrine therapy. This is a cancer that is smarter than, 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 than we thought it is. And continuing down the road of giving more endocrine therapy is unlikely to make a big difference. So that patient might benefit more from chemotherapy or these new drugs that we haven't talked at all about, the antibody drug conjugates for the next lines of therapy. But let's say that now, the CDK4-6 inhibitor and, and the aromatase inhibitor work for 16, 20, 30 months. And then at some point, the cancer grows. That's where we start doing our testing to see what does the cancer have as far as mutations. Does it have a PIK3CA mutation? Does it have an ESR1 mutation? If it has an ESR1 mutation, then that's where elicestrin comes in, and we give the elicestrin to the patient. If the cancer has a PIK3CA mutation, then we consider giving alpelisib 
in combination with another endocrine therapy, which is going to be fulvestrin. The cancer doesn't have any mutation, then we give everolimus, uh, typically in combination with fulvestrin. Now, what if it has both mutations? What if it has a pic 3 ca mutation and an ESR1 mutation, which happens around 20 or so percent of these cancers will see both mutations. Uh, well, that's where we don't have tons of data, but we know that, that alpelisib is not going to be extremely active. And so we also know that alpelisib has its own toxicities. It causes quite a lot of increase in blood sugars. A lot of our patients are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Uh, it can cause a rash. It can cause diarrhea. It's not a very easy drug to take. So I personally... Uh, prefer giving elicestrin to a single agent because it's a much better tolerated drug. And uh, it, again, if these ESR1 mutations develop, it looks like alpelisib may not be as active as it was in, in tumors that don't have these ESR1 mutations. And then at some point, unfortunately, the cancer gets smarter and smarter and smarter the more drugs we give it. And then once we, we realize that it, it has become endocrine resistant, then we switch to chemotherapy. So that brings me to the next question that was submitted. Um, you know, this ESR1 mutation and the treatment, Elicestrin, was just FDA approved just pretty recently. Um, and a lot of the patients have already been on like Stelota or even IV chemo because they progressed before we knew about the ESR1 mutation or or at least it wasn't approved. At, do you, would you ever say, hey, you know what, Elicestrin, it has less side effects, you know, maybe, maybe we can look back and see if we can try this. Would you ever do that for a patient, just kind of go back and, and change the sequence? Absolutely. And the Emerald trial actually included women that had been on one chemotherapy before. So we have the data. So it really just has to do with, with, with trying to, 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 to attack the tumor from different uh, vantage points. You attack it from the estrogen pathway, you attack it from the, the, the PI3 kinase, you attack it from the cytotoxic effects of chemotherapy, and then you can go back to the estrogen pathway. So, so we definitely do that and we have seen that it's effective. So many of the women that had previously been on chemotherapy when they were given elicestrin on the trial, had had disease response. So that's definitely something an, an approach that we can take. And, and as you mentioned, um, it's much less toxic than giving chemotherapy. Thank you so much. I actually have a question that may be premature, but I will ask it anyway. So originally, when the three CDK four six inhibitors were approved. It was considered, they were considered interchangeable, right? It was up to a uh, an oncologist to choose whatever the preference uh, they had. It turns out that, in fact, they're not interchangeable and they're not the same. And there is more and more information coming out that there is a difference. So what is your opinion? And maybe it's too early to say, but will all these many oral certs Will they be interchangeable or you, or you think there is some difference in their mechanism of action or already now clear that they will not be the same? So um, the, 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 the quick answer is I have no idea. <laughs> but, but, you know, initially when the aromatase inhibitors came out, there were three aromatase inhibitors and everybody was arguing about which one was the best. And then we found out they're all exactly the same. Um, and then the CDK46 inhibitors came out and, and they all had preclinical data. And depending on what data you looked at, you thought one was better or the other one was better, or the third one was better. But then the clinical data came out and, and, and now we think, we're not 100% sure because we don't have head-to-head -head trials and we never will have. But we think that maybe ribocyclib is better than palbocyclib. And we think probably a bemocyclib might be better as well, but we don't know. Uh, but but there was some preclinical data that suggested that being the case. But there was also preclinical data with the aromatase inhibitors suggesting that that one of them, letrozole, for example, prevented estrogen um, production more than an astrozole did, and apparently made no difference in in in, in the clinic. So we, we don't know. But but all of this stuff is is going to take a little bit of time. 
to decipher now, we know that two of the uh, oral surge, one of them called Gerdestrand, um, for example, they did not uh, meet their initial clinical trial uh, endpoints. And so they're still being looked at, but um, one of them actually, they stopped production altogether because they, they, were, they, they looked at two trials and they were both negative. So they're definitely not all the same, but the ones that have progressed so far um, seem to be kind of the better of the bunch. And, and then we'll see. And I think part of it, and this is all drug development, is, is how smart and lucky drug companies are to come up with the right design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were lucky enough to come up out with the right design for Emerald and, uh, and it worked, which is great for patients, obviously, but there are some other drugs that uh, or some other designs that may not work as well. Thank you so much. Kate, can I just quickly ask a follow-up question because I will forget if I don't do it now. So it's interesting, you were just talking about the trial designs. And I noticed in your, um, in your slides that we're not using today, there was a trial that actually had two different dosing. Uh, and it may, be, it may have been exactly that's the Ember trial, right? Where they-, they It was the, the Serena 3 trial. Was it the Serena 3? Okay, yeah where they were testing two different dosings. And I think, you know, this is becoming a big issue, this patient dosing initiative that is uh, quite quite uh, well known. And uh, doctors are talking more and more and more about different dosing uh, variations. And we, Kate and I run support groups, and that's one of the most popular topics about CDK4-6 inhibitors, especially abemocyclic, where very few people can tolerate the uh, maximum maximum dose that's being used. So, how many of these trials now are being uh, are being written in such a way where the different dosing dosing uh, variations are allowed? So, God, this is such an important point, and this is where you all, as patients and patient advocates, can make a huge difference. Thank you. So. Um, and, and, and your voice needs to be heard because guess what? You guys are the ones taking those drugs. So historically, when we've done our drug development, we've done these phase one clinical trials. These are trials that are dose finding trials. That's all. Now, you know, with every trial we look at, well, is the drug effective or not? But when we talk about nine, 10, 12 patients, you can't really tell how effective the drug is, but you want it to be at least a little effective to spend the money to do larger trials. So these phase one trials, the way they were designed was we put three patients on one dose. And if at least two of them have done are doing great, then um, we continue to the next dose and then the next dose and then the next dose. And if, you know, if, if, if we have somebody that has like serious uh, problems with that dose, then we treat another three patients. And if they're fine, then we keep going up. If we get to a dose where it's kind of pretty toxic, then we stop. That's called the maximum tolerated dose, MTD. Think about this, maximum tolerated dose. Says nothing about efficacy. It's not the maximum efficacious dose. It's not the biologically best dose. It's the dose where we're almost killing people, but we're kind of not. And that's the dose that'll go on to the next trial, to the next, the phase two trial and the phase three trial. And then eventually that's the dose that's going to get approved by the FDA. And there's no science behind that dose besides how toxic is it for the patient. And so we have all these drugs, including chemotherapeutic drugs, where we're giving them probably at a much higher dose than we should be giving them or we need to give them. And for example, you talked about CDK4-6 inhibitors and the studies in the metastatic setting showed that even women that just couldn't tolerate those drugs that well, and we had to reduce the dose and reduce the dose, did exactly the same as the women that stayed on the regular dose, which I'll call the high dose, but the regular dose of that drug. So why are we giving it at that high dose? Because that's how the studies were done, and nobody bothered to, to look at what is the biologic effect of that dose? Could we get away with a lower dose? Um, and so we need to change our drug development. And, and now we're kind of, at least we're talking about it. We're talking about the, the you know, finding the, 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 
the the best biological dose instead of the maximum tolerated dose. And, and this may be the case with, with these oral serves. And, and so going to really your question of are, are, can we test a couple doses? So, so drug companies obviously want to send take their drugs out as quickly as possible. And the drug development uh, timelines, we're talking about 10 years from the day that the drug company says, I want to develop this drug to the day the FDA approves it. And some, somewhere down the line, they get a patent for that drug. And that patent will last for 10, 15 years, depending on how smart their lawyers are. And that's when they're going to make all their money. So the quicker they approve the drug, the more time they have on the drug patent and the more money they're going to make off of their drug. So they're in a hurry. Obviously, they're also in a hurry because they don't want to spend as much, a lot of money producing the drug, right? So how can they do this? How can they speed up this drug development? Well, instead of doing really good work in that phase one setting, they say, well, you know, we got a couple doses and, and they seem to be okay. So instead of just trying to figure out what's the best biologic dose, let's just give both of those doses to the patients. And then in a large enough patient population, then we can figure out if there's a difference or not, or at least we think we can figure out the difference. And maybe we're lucky enough, we pick the right dose, and then we go on to those phase three trials. So that's one way of doing it. Or the other way, which is a little bit of a slower way of actually doing the good work in that phase one setting. Um, so, so that's why you're seeing that Serena three trial where they looked at 75 milligrams and 150 milligrams. And, you know, there was an indication that the 150 was probably a little bit better. Um, but is it enough better to make a difference in the large trials? We don't know, but uh, at least they tested two doses instead of just going with, with one and, and, and praying it's the right dose. Uh, so there's downsides to everything. Obviously, we all want these drugs to be successful and we want them to, to, to be available for our patients yesterday. Uh, but there's so many drugs out there that we're using them at a lower dose compared to the dose that was approved by the FDA because the dose that was approved was too toxic for our patients. And there's also several drugs that are dead because we did not do a good drug discovery. And the, when we started using those drugs, they were just too hard for our patients and nobody ever took them and nobody ever prescribed them. Um, so this is where you all need to, need to make your, um, your opinions heard because we all do this for you. And, and so we need to do right by you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to mention the uh, the uh, the drug that's not it's not what we're discussing right now, but in her too, uh is one of is a good example of this showing more and more. And I think at ASMO it showed how wonderful this drug is and how uh, it's showing more and more positive results. But patients have such a hard time with this drug. And there are stories and it's becoming, you know, it's becoming so difficult to even persuade people to go on this drug because they've heard it's so horrible. No, you're right. And that's an, uh, a targeted drug, an antibody drug conjugate that shouldn't be this toxic. Yeah. Um, and so it's not the only one. It's, it's a good drug. It's a really good drug. It's revolutionized our treatment. Um, but again, initially, when, when you look at the, the, the first studies that they did, they increased the dose enough that they had so much lung toxicity with that drug, they, they had to go down on the dose. Yeah. Um, and different tumors, sometimes they use different doses. Uh, same thing with Everolimus for, for breast cancer, we use a higher dose than they use for uh, kidney cancer. Yeah. So, so do we really need that high of a dose or not? So this is really an issue with pretty much every drug we have. With chemotherapy, we've kind of figured it out because we've used it for so many years. But I mean, think about this. At ASCO this year, they presented a study on Zelota, Cape yeah. Side. This so, is a drug that I we had when I was a fellow. Mm -hmm. And I was a fellow more than 20 years ago. So this is an old drug. And of course, and you were 17 at the time because you're a genius. <laughs> 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 um, not sure about that, but, uh, so, so this is an old drug that we've been using for colon cancer and breast cancer and, and, and the dose 
that the FDA approved was two, two, 2,500 milligrams a day based on your body weight. So if you, if you had a, a body surface area of two, you were getting 5,000 milligrams a day. We all knew it was high. And in the US, nobody could use it at that high dose. We were using 2,000 milligrams. Now in Asia, apparently they were using 2,500, but in the US, we were never using that. Well, the study that was presented showed that even the 2,000 is too high of a dose. And if we change the schedule, if we change the dose to a fixed dose that's not dependent on, on our body surface area, the drug works as well. So it took us over 20 years to figure this out with a drug that we use daily for our patients and not just for one disease type. Unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. Thank you so oh, much. I, thank you. I hope we're seeing a trend now that that, that will be on in, in consideration with trials going forward because we've seen positive trials doing that. Um, I want to take it back to the liquid biopsies. We've had some questions regarding that. Um, you know, if you could just like maybe discuss how frequently you would recommend them. Um, yeah. So yeah. the liquid biopsy, so there's two forms of biopsies, the, the uh, regular tissue biopsies and the liquid biopsies. The liquid biopsy is obviously significantly easier to do because it's a blood test. Um, the, the tissue biopsies, we, we do them initially when we, we think the cancer has spread. And, and I personally do them for a couple of reasons. The one is because I need to be sure that the cancer has spread. And, and uh, it hasn't only happened once where the radiologist said, oh yeah, this is cancer and I do a biopsy and it's not cancer. And I'm not gonna tell a woman she has metastatic breast cancer unless I know. And the only way to 100% know is by doing a tissue biopsy. The other reason is that th that ER, the estrogen receptor and the HER2 actually change over time. And so you wanna do a biopsy to see how that is now and what the expression is, because that changes your treatment. And obviously by doing this biopsy, you can also do what's called next generation sequencing where we're looking at all of these mutations. So you can look at the big 3 ca mutation, you can look at BRCA mutations, you can look at a bunch of stuff. You can also look at the ESR1 mutation, but again, that changes over time. Uh, so I typically do that tissue biopsy initially just to see what I'm, what I'm looking at, but I'm not really looking at ESR1 mutations at that point. Once I've done my first therapy and then and the cancer has, has grown, then I do a liquid biopsy to look at that ESR1 mutation. Now, if I think the cancer is still endocrine sensitive and the patient is still in a candidate for endocrine therapy, then I will keep doing these liquid biopsies every time the cancer progresses. Because I know that if I identify an ESR1 mutation at some point, then I can give alicestrone to my patient and I can benefit them from this drug. Now, if I think that the cancer is endocrine resistant and I switch to chemotherapy and I'm not planning on going back to endocrine therapy for many reasons, then I won't do these liquid biopsies because they don't help me uh, make treatment changes. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. We have another question. So that kind of follows the same line. Um, of what you were talking about. So I just want to um, put this into perspective. So if someone's on uh, an AI and they seem to be progressing, you would take a liquid biopsy to see what's going on there if there's a mutation. And if there isn't, you would then sequence to... Sequence to maybe Everolimus and, uh, or if they have not received the CDK4-6 inhibitor, give a CDK4-6 inhibitor. If they have a PIK3CA mutation, you can switch, switch to alpelacib. So a lot of different options. But if they don't have an ESR1 mutation, then you can't use elicestrin because it wasn't approved that way. Right, right. So you would, would you consider the comb like the combination, like with, um, you know, Affinidor or mm -hmm. would you do monotherapy or even fulvestrin? You could do any of these things. Um, the the Emerald trial was based on women that had received the CDK4-6 inhibitor before. Yeah. So the first step for most women, not everybody, but most women is to give a CDK4-6 inhibitor in that first line setting. Now, once you've given that CDK4-6 inhibitor, what we found on the Emerald trial, regardless of the SR1 mutation, is that giving fulvestrant as a monotherapy is really not very active. 
is not very effective. So then we rely on combination therapy, which is with everolimus and fulvestrin yeah, yeah. or apelosib and fulvestrin and so forth. But if a woman has not received the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting, then giving that CDK4-6 inhibitor in the second line setting with fulvestrin is perfectly uh, uh, fine. Or giving fulvestrin monotherapy in that second line setting, we have data suggesting that that's, you know, it'll be more active. Um, we rarely do that, but we can. Again, it's balance of toxicity and efficacy at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have another question that was posted where they asked the first the first part of the question was where you can get uh, alicestrin, and you've answered that, I think. But there is a bigger question as the second part of that, actually, and it's an important one to understand. And again, we we face it quite often when we have uh, members of our support groups who progress. And um, there is a point in the cycle where you say, OK, now is a good time maybe to start a trial. I mean, in the past, as we all know it used to, people used to think, oh, it's a Hail Mary thing, but it's not anymore. Now, now trials are becoming a lot more part of our regular treatment. So, uh, so the question is, how does one look for a trial? And that's, you know, it's, it's so complicated because most of, most of our patients are not treated in cancer centers that have their own trial but most are treated in uh, local hospitals. So the question is, what do you do when you feel like this is a good time to maybe explore a possibility of going on a trial? Uh, that's another great question as well. So I, I would uh, venture to say that there's always a good time to be on a clinical trial, as long as it's the right trial. So we have trials in the neoadjuvant setting where women were just diagnosed with breast cancer, haven't even had surgery yet. We have trials in the adjuvant setting. We have trials in the first line metastatic setting. And, and the reason we have all these drugs available is because women before us were brave enough to participate on clinical trials. But I'll say brave because obviously it takes bravery, but, but, but we also have to understand that these clinical trials are so regulated by so many people that it's really not a Hail Mary. And, and it hasn't been that way for 50, 70 years. So there's a lot of different clinical trials. There's phase one trials where we try to figure out the dose of the drug, phase two trials where we think the drug is active and we wanna get initial kind of a feeling of how active it is. And then a phase three trial, which is typically the trial that the FDA looks at to approve a drug, drug or not. And some of them succeed, some of them fail. But overall, the, the, the data that we have shows that women that participate in clinical trials live longer than women that don't participate in clinical trials, which means that most of these trials are actually effective. Also, I think we monitor patients on these trials so closely that um, we don't miss things that we otherwise might miss because we're all human beings. So on the trial, you have your study coordinator, you have your physician, you have the the monitor, the study monitor, you have a bunch of people that are just looking over you. And, and so fewer mistakes happen if really no mistakes happen. Now, where do you find these trials? And, and the good thing is that most centers, whether they're academic or community, have access to trials. They may not have access to every single trial, nobody can, but they do have access to trials. So the right time to think about this is when it looks like the cancer is progressing. If the cancer is progressing and you're in the middle of trying to figure out what treatment to do, that's where you say, hey, is there a clinical trial I can go on? Is there a better, you know, is there a new treatment or, or, or a tweak to an older treatment that, that might benefit me? And so you ask your physician. But the other thing that you do, because you are your best advocate, is you go on this website that is regulated by the, by the uh, National Cancer Institute, and it's called clinicaltrials.gov. And there's a physician website and there's a patient website. And it's very simple because all you type is you type your condition and you, and, and then it tells you what, and then you also type your location if you want to. If you don't want to be traveling too much, you say, you know, 20 miles from this or whatever it is. And they give you a list of trials that are active. 
and 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 you may or may not have the the knowledge to to understand which ones are really the best ones for you but that's where you print that piece of paper you take it to your doctor and you say hey look at these is one is are any of them important for me to be participating in but you know we should be talking to patients about clinical trials but when we're busy in clinic sometimes we might forget it uh, but i can tell you that if a patient asks me is there a clinical trial that i'm eligible for even if I don't have that trial, I'm going to go on that website and I'm going to say, hey, you know what? There is one and it's down the, down the street. And why don't you go talk to my colleague and I'll give them a call. Thank you. Uh, it, we were just talking about this this afternoon and, you know, it's it's really important. And we wonder, you know, there's so many trials. We see so many trials and there's so many trials and they're everywhere. And, you know, especially us with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer and the thought that, you know, that eventually maybe we will, most of us will become endocrine resistant. Um, it just seems like, you know, we should all be on a clinical trial or, or even be offered the clinical trial because there's so many out there. You're right. So less than 5% of our patients go on clinical trials. On top of it, the majority are Caucasians, or now we say non-Hispanic whites. So we have little information on Blacks, and we have little information on Hispanics. And that's everybody's fault, mostly ours, I'm sure. Uh, but the fact that only 5% of our patients, imagine how much progress we would have made yeah. if 20% went on clinical trials, not five. All of these trials would accrue, instead of accruing in two years, they'd accrue in six months. And then we'd get results quickly. And then we'd be able to, to approve drugs or get rid of drugs that we don't think are effective. So it, it's such a powerful thing, but unfortunately, you know, and, and some of these trials are just complicated. Some of them require more visits. If, you know, if, you, if you're a young woman and you have a couple of kids and you have to pick them up from school and I tell you that you have to come an extra one time every every few weeks, you may say, I can't afford it, or you may not have time, you know, you may not may not have money, or you may not have a ride. Or if I tell you that the treatment is going to take an extra half hour because we have to observe you or something like that, you may say, you know what, I, I can't afford to do that because I have to pick up my kids from school. There's a lot of a lot of things that that happen that as much support as we try to give every single person, there's so many other sociological and economical factors that go into this that we just we 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 you know we we have we struggle accruing patients on trials do you have any recommendations on how we as advocates and patients can can help that process like looking forward maybe something that we can do i think it's education educating patients about the 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 trials and 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 the benefits of being on a trial again it doesn't mean that every, that every single patient should go on every single trial but yeah. if you know if you're first, first of all you need to have a physician that you trust and that physician needs to look at the trial and say yeah you know what i think this is a, the, the the best trial for you um and then you you need to you, you need to understand that this is not you know, when we talk about, especially in cancer, are you going to take a sugar pill? You're not only taking a sugar pill. We, we don't just use placebo. We use, if you take a sugar pill, you're taking it with another drug that is active. Um, it, it, so it's the understanding of what these clinical trials do. And it's not, you know, we, we, we you know, women, I had a patient that said, well, I, I'm not going to think about the women ahead of me. I'm thinking about myself. And I don't blame her. Of course, she has to think about herself. But I tried to explain that it, it is because she's thinking about herself that she should think about participating on these trials because they may benefit her. And like I said, women that participate in trials live longer. So these trials do benefit our patients. Um, it's, but 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 we, we do make it hard. You, know, you have consent forms that are 22 pages long and we expect women to read them and not be scared. And if you read any consent form, you'd be scared. And so you have to kind of put that out of your mind if you want to participate on a, on a clinical trial. So, so for you as advocates, try to, and we try to do the same thing, but try to educate women and, and, and make them be, not be scared of clinical trials and explain to them that the reason they have the treatments that they have available is because other women participated in these trials. And if they hadn't, we wouldn't have any, any treatment for breast cancer. We'd still be treating breast cancer with tamoxifen. 
uh, which by the way is a great drug, but now we have other drugs that are better. So that's the whole point of doing this clinical research. It's not easy. It's, it's really hard, but, but it's necessary. So that's, that's a good thought. We have some work to do, all of us, I think, as a team, for sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Kakumani, for the informative program. And thanks to all of you participating and submitting questions. Just a reminder, a recording of this pr presentation will be available on our website at sharecancersupport.org in one to two weeks. Make sure to check out SHARE's website for upcoming educational programs and support groups. And don't forget to follow us on social media as well. Victoria. I think you're muted. I think Victoria is having some technical difficulties. I'll step yes, in. I, I will say oh, there she is. Okay. Because I've only been work. I've only worked in technology for 25 years, and I can't figure out how to use a computer. Dr. Kakumani, thank you so much. This was such an incredible, wonderful presentation. We appreciate it so much. And I have so many more questions to ask you. So you will have to come on the podcast to answer all the questions that I wrote down and had no chance to, to ask. But I also wanted to point out to a question we had on uh, online. Somebody asked us how we can join a support group that gives information. So not to toot our own horn, but Kate and I have, a, have two support groups at SHARE that actually do exactly that. We provide information. So thank you so very much. And um, there was something I was supposed to say, right? Kate, can you actually read Please it? Please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends and there will be a link also in a follow-up email, just so you know that all surveys are anonymous. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all so very much for participating and thank you again, Dr. Kaklamani. Thank you both. Thank you so much.